Hey guys, welcome to part two. I'm here with Abraham and welcome to the Jesus King podcast. How we doing guys? How are we Martin? I'm good man. I really enjoyed part one. Yeah, it was good. And I'm actually pretty excited for part two. It's always a good refresher. I think um, as men, it's always a good thing to go through the basics mm. of what the biblical mandate is um, with any doctrine and with any aspect of life. It's always good to refresh yourself so that you can recalibrate and see where am i falling where sure. where where am i missing the mark here and yeah. even going through um the content that we did in the last episode i was thinking to myself where have i kind of missed the mark at times um in my own family um, with the people around me how i present myself how i'm living and it's a very convicting thing it's True. it's really good to to go through that and say you know what I failed here, I failed there, and I need to recalibrate, set my eyes on Christ, set my eyes on um, what Christ valued as a man, and how I need to do that same thing, yeah. to seek the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and then leave the rest with God, and he'll do it, and he'll God. I mean, well, that's, what, that's what's so amazing. It's such a blessing to have a biblical perspective on this topic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. A lot of people try just to look at it from the natural world mm -hmm. and look at their culture and see how could I be a successful man, Yeah, you yeah. know, among my peers and so on. Uh, but then we look at the example of the Bible and we can see that the Bible actually gives you good instructions on how to be a man. And it's objective. So it like, is. so this is one of the things we, we were touching on as well, like masculinity and that definition, how it changes across culture and time mm. you know so like what masculinity looked like in the 70s and 80s versus what it looks like now in our culture but then even across different cultures when we look in you know let's say in saudi arabia or the middle east what masculinity looks like for them because of you know the muslim um, influence yeah. and what the quran says about what it means to be a man yeah. and the way that they treat their women and you look at that in the eastern cultures with buddhism as well so we've got to kind of look at how different cultures view masculinity and how it can it's so subject to change it's True. so subject to um where you are and when you are mm -hmm. whereas the bible's like no this is the way to be a man no matter where you are yeah no matter so, what time yeah. so in part one we, mm -hmm. we did speak about what a man should look for mm -hmm. a, as a man yeah. Um, in part two, we want to speak about how does a man view a woman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're living together on this earth, right? No one's coming from Mars. No one coming from Venus. God created both man and woman on earth. <laughs> so we live with each other. We're like 50, 50%, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. So you're living with around 4 billion people yep. that are females, yep. right? And modern masculinity obviously have a certain perspective of how women think, yeah. what right. they do with their bodies, and how these masculine men, right, red pill, mm -hmm. which should treat their women. Yeah. Yeah. So the red pill men, what they've done is they're regressing back to about like the 1960s and 1970s, mm. the way that men viewed women, the way that they lived their lives. Um, with a few different alterations and they've kind of repackaged it a little but they're looking at how were men then and how can we go back to that it's not the best time to go back to though you know if you look at the 50s 60s 70s you know the men who were wife beaters and you know they dominated and oppressed their wives rather than yeah. look at them as you know a companion so um, when we look at the red pill men and the way that they view women they view them as objects rather than companions you know we they look at this woman and they say you're not really here to impart any wisdom in my life you're not really here to to help and support me in our mission in this life you're here just to serve just sure. to do what i told you to do and that's it yeah yeah so it's the idea that i'm having you in my life to benefit myself to, yeah, yeah and when you look at the teachings of the bible it speaks about how we are ought to serve one another mm -hmm. so serving 
for example, in a relationship or in marriage, it's not a one-way traffic. No, absolutely not. It's both ways. So I get to serve and love my wife as well as my wife get to serve me yeah. and love me. Yeah. And we're going to get to also Ephesians 5 speaking about submission. Yeah. And obviously there is a bit of a difference between submission and, and, and yeah. service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this whole idea that I get home, my wife is ready, there's a beer in my hand, there's a sandwich in my hand, mm -hmm. and the house is clean, and that is a sign of a successful marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when you see that kind of perspective, you think, how low of an IQ do, do you have for, for you to see that as, as a marriage that could last yeah. Yeah. the next 50 years? Yeah, because... Or, yeah. or being spiritually one, right? You look at the book of Genesis... Adam says, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother and become mm -hmm. one with his wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How could you be spiritually one yeah. Yeah. if the only thing that you're getting out of your partner is it's, what you could get from yeah. an emplo employee, right? Yeah, with just the addition of sex and that's it. So you got yeah. food and sex and yeah. then that's it. And True. that's not the way to view a human being who's made in the image of God. Yeah. And this is where we're always going back to Genesis chapter one. We go back to the design of marriage and the design of a man and a woman and the way that they're both made in the image of God to complement one another. Yeah. You know, I was going to bring it up since yeah. we were speaking about Ephesians five. Mm -hmm. um, I could say Ephesians five, I believe it's 22. Yeah. Wives submit to your husbands and a lot of Christians that fell into this red pill movement, they use this passage to try and justify that movement yeah and yeah but they obviously <clears throat> they they distort the message you yeah know? and and we both we believe that this is biblical and we believe that wives are to submit to their husbands mm -hmm. the husband is the head of of his wife yeah. of his family mm -hmm. there's no disagreement of that but let's not take the text further than what it intends mm -hmm. right and this is what the text continues to be saying wives submit to your to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, and, and this is what we want to talk as well about. Um, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to her take that so, red pill man yeah so <laughs> that, that kind of goes against the the red pill man, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who he who loves his wife loves himself. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, so the idea that if you're if you actually love yourself, you gotta love your wife mm -hmm. because the same way that a man and this is this is the hypocrisy of the red pill spend say as you were saying, six, seven hours, taking care of your body, taking care of your mind. Mm -hmm. mind. So what are you doing? You're loving your body, right? So if you're going to spend that much time to love your body, yeah. the Bible is saying that you love your wife as you love your body, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Who, who's going to hate their body? No one. Everyone's going to want the best for their bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny um, when, you're, when you're talking about the red pill men and that ideology, They'll look at the words of Paul here and they'll be like, this guy's a beta. He's a beta man. Yeah. You know, he's not, he's not living his alpha truth. You know, mm -hmm. they, they talk about this and you're looking at Christ who was the ultimate model of masculinity. And a lot of these men call themselves Christians who believe in this ideology. They call themselves Christians and they look at how Jesus has treated his bride and how he views her. Mm. And that we're supposed to model our marriages after that. And they're not correlating that information and they're not, they're not using that in their daily life. It's kind of like they have this whole blind spot when it comes to women versus every other aspect of their life or masculinity. And it's a very dangerous thing because when you start to 
misinterpret one aspect of the Christian message, it starts to seep through and filter through every part of your life. Yeah. So when you get this wrong in your marriage, it's going to affect the way your children view you. It's going to affect your family. It's going to affect your ministry. It will affect everything. True. And so we've seen a lot of men and ministries fall because of this, because men have treated their wives in such horrible ways. I've seen it personally in, um, in a lot of the, the spheres um, that are in a lot of um, parts of my life and with family members and with friends who their ministries, which could have been such great things, fell because of bad marriages, because of the way they've treated their wives. And most often than not, and I truly do believe this, um, in most cases of divorce uh, and separation and that kind of thing and the deterioration of marriages, it's because men have not lived up to this truth. Yeah. They haven't loved their wives. They haven't given themselves up for her. They haven't washed her with the word of God. They haven't done what Christ has done mm -hmm. for the church. So it's, it's more like you're more concerned about your wife taking care of the needs of your belly, mm -hmm. right? Taking care of the needs of the house and obviously satisfying your sexual needs. Yep. And here we see that Paul is coming with this other perspective of saying, no, men, you do have a big responsibility in leading your wife because she's submitting to you. Yeah. So you have that responsibility that you need to lead your wife because you yourself, you're being led by Christ mm -hmm. and you need to love her as you're loving yourself and using Christ as an example between Christ and the church and a husband and his wife, mm -hmm. it shows that Christ is not going out there looking for other wives. That's right. He's exactly. faithful to exactly. the church. Exactly. He's faithful to us. Imagine that as well. If Christ comes and saying, I no longer want to have anything to do with the church mm. because it's a big mess, right? We're, we're sinners. We're under the grace of God. And Jesus is dealing with our problems every single day. Imagine that saying, you know what? You're too much of a hassle for me. You're no benefit to me. Mm. I will let you go. Mm. Husbands today are falling into this modern masculinity of saying, well, my marriage is a mess. Yeah. yeah. My, my wife could be aging. She's getting older. She's mm. giving me a few kids. That's a blessing. But her body doesn't look like what it used to be. Yeah. So I'm not I attracted can, to her anymore. Yeah, yeah. I can find something else. Imagine if Jesus himself had the same perspective. Mm. I don't think none of us would be happy with that. Yeah. And second thing, Jesus himself, even in the gospel of John, I believe it's in uh, John 13, mm. where he speaks, where, where Jesus actually washes the feet of his own disciples. Yeah. And we forget that, yes, they are his disciples, but at the same time, they are the church. Yeah. yeah. So how many husbands would have the humility to be serving their wives the way Jesus yeah. served his disciples? So and even that was as, a, as an example, right, yeah. for all yeah. of us. That, that one thing you said there that's really important to kind of take note of is the way that Jesus has viewed the church and what he's done. Um, these men that come in and they're like, well, my marriage is just a mess. Mm. And they put all the blame of that onto the woman instead of saying, all right, where have I gone wrong and what can I do to fix this? And it all always boils down to the word of God, coming back to God, realigning your life to the will of God. If you are leading your wife, Nine times out of ten, if you are leading your wife in the ways of God and your family in the ways of God, even though it's hard in the flesh, they actually do naturally tend to submit to you. Mm. They'll see the strength. They'll see your closeness to God. They'll see that you have a vision and a mission, spiritually speaking. You have a direction in life for your family that it makes it easier for her to submit. Yeah. So basically, it's like real men stay and fix the problem. Exactly. Cowards are the ones that walk away from their marriages, from their relationship, and find an easier way to yeah. satisfy themselves. We're talking about this um, in, we kind of touched on this in the in the first part, that um, the red pill ideology looks at um, the high body count. You know, you talk yeah. about this sleeping around with different women. Mm. That is a sign of strength. You've conquered this woman. You've, you've, sure. you, you, you're victorious here. But the Bible and, and the biblical view looks at that as a form of cowardice because you're giving in to your temptations. You're giving in to your flesh instead of having the strength to say no. Yeah. No. 
I will say no to the flesh and I'll live by the spirit. That's true strength. Like yeah. you, you and I both know this when we talk about, um, in our own personal life, saying no to the flesh. I remember we did that, you know, the 40 day fasts, mm. how hard it is to control your appetite. And you look at that both from, you know, in the physical world, um, you look at that without food, without, you know, sex, saying no to the things of the spirit. And you're, you're like, well, it's because I'm esteeming the things of the spirit, saying no to the things of the flesh, sorry. It's because we're looking at the things of the spirit as our ultimate priority. Amen. And walking in the spirit, you don't gratify the desires exactly. of the flesh. So the whole idea is that if you want to examine yourself and the path that you're taking, whether it is in the spirit and satisfying God, then you'll find yourself not giving in to those temptations. Mm. And it's easy for men these days, especially when the option is so vast out there yeah. and it's easy. Do with to, online, to, online, the oh, online yeah. stuff and the online dating and the accessibility you have to such detrimental things. It's And what's interesting, I, I, I want to get there. Uh, but before I get there, I want to I want us to read a verse here. It's in First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Mm. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife, as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your praise may not be hindered. So we can see here, being heirs together of the grace of life is the value that we have in God. Yeah. Right? We are yeah. equally valuable in God. But we can see that there is a difference here. Men ought to honor their wives as to a weaker vessel. Mm. Now, a lot of people would look at that and they would take that as an advantage because if you find a weakness in someone and often, for example, on, on a soccer team mm -hmm. right, um, or football, whatever you, you play or watch, that one team will try and find a weakness in the other team yeah. and will try and exploit that. And often sometimes that happens within relationship in marriage. Mm -hmm. The husbands would try to exploit the weakness of their wives and use that against them. Mm. But what they don't recognize is there's no two teams playing in that marriage. Yeah, exactly. They are one flesh, they are one team. So if you think about it this way, if you're one team and you have a weakness in your team, what do you do? Mm. You strengthen it, you That's protect right. it. That's right. So the whole point of it, if you find weakness in your partner and men are not perfect, they have a, their weaknesses too. If there is a weakness in your partner, you don't get to exploit it. God has shown it to you for a reason. Mm -hmm. You're ought to protect and edify the person. That's right. That's right. You don't just protect and let the person live that way, right? You're meant to edify and encourage them to overcome their weaknesses. This is a very important thing because oftentimes when we talk about the deterioration of marriages, um, a lot of women and a lot of times um, the deterioration of marriages, usually it's the woman today who is initiating divorces. And it's because the men who don't lead their wives, they're not strengthening, as you're saying, they're not strengthening those weak points and mm -hmm. the weaknesses that they see. Men have weak points. Absolutely, we do. And our wives will definitely let us know where they are. They do, yeah. They do. But um, <laughs> if you're seeing a weak point in your wife and you ignore it, instead of saying, and this, I'm guilty of this as well, but you ignore it and you don't feed or, or feed her with the word of God to strengthen it, what will happen? You were talking about... Um, people finding the weak link in your marriage. A lot of the deterioration in marriages is because other men will see your wife, that her needs are not being met, and they look at that as a weakness, and that's the key to destroying that marriage. Mm. Satan did that in the Garden of Eden. I was literally going to say that. Yeah. Where, where do we know of something yeah. like that? So Satan comes in to the weak, weaker vessel of the marriage, comes to Eve to start breaking the walls down, Eve falls and then turns to Adam and then Adam falls because of Eve, right? Yeah. Because, well, you know, in his own weakness, because he didn't do, he didn't fulfill the role that he was there for to strengthen her, to protect her, to provide for her spiritual needs and to say no and intervene and say, no, here's the weakness and here I am to lead. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 
Well, you did bring up a good point. You, you spoke about how um, the modern masculinity is viewing women, for example, with high body count. Mm -hmm. And I only realized what the meaning of that meaning, like, for example, women who would sleep around mm -hmm. and they have many different partners. Um, they would treat them as these are not marriage material. Yeah. These are prostitutes. And if you want to have fun, you could spend mm -hmm. your time with them. Yeah. But it's not like you're looking for a meaningful relationship. No, it's like a practice run. You know? It is, yeah. it is. Yeah. But then when we look at the Bible and we're looking at Jesus being our example, he did come across women mm. who were considered to be prostitutes yeah. Yeah. or with quote unquote high body count. Mm. One example is um, John chapter four, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's had five husbands and the person that she was with is not even her husband. Jesus didn't be like, oh, well, she just looks like she's prostituted herself. She can't keep a house. Mm -hmm. So she's going from one man to another. Why do I need to bother myself with her? Yeah. Yet Jesus used that woman, changed her heart, and she changed her whole village. She went back to her village. She told them what Jesus said to her and the village came to Jesus and said, could you stay with us? Mm. So Jesus used a broken person and what, what we see here with high body count, yeah. a broken person and turned them into something that is so beautiful that he created himself originally and he used them to be influential mm. in their lives. Yeah. So please, Christian men, don't look down at people especially women, if they have their high body count or they're sleeping around. Men do that as well. Mm. We, we shouldn't be having that, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have the mindset of hypocrisy yeah. where you treat certain people differently than others. Both of them are a sin, right? Whether it's a man doing it or whether a woman is doing yeah. it. Yeah. We call birth to repentance. If a man does it and he repents, could he be a marriage material? Of course, of course. he can, yeah. because yeah. Christ has changed his heart. Why can't that happen to women? That can happen to women as well. God changes the woman's heart and she can be the most amazing wife. Yeah. A lot of it, I think, is it's also a matter of pride. You know, men, um, they take pride in their women being mm. like a trophy. You know, like I'm victorious and I'm, I'm, I've conquered and here's my accomplishment and she's unstained. She's pure. You know, and so it's more of an accomplishment. That's that's a it's an unbiblical way to view it because we are all broken, we're all scarred, we're we're living in this fallen world, and the message of the gospel is there's grace, there's redemption, restoration, no matter what right. the past is. And I think one of the things that tends to happen is men will look at the weaknesses and the brokenness of a woman with, you know, they're pulling the the speck out of her eye before seeing the, the log. plank and the log yeah. in their own. Um, we are post the sexual revolution. Men are sleeping around like never before. Yeah. And they're getting a lot of advice from a lot of these um, ideologies to just keep doing it. Explore that sexual um, avenue. Do as much as you can before you settle down and find that right one. Got a, another example, actually, yeah. of the way Jesus dealt with these type of women. And that's mm -hmm. Luke seven, uh, verse 36. And it starts, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And mm -hmm. he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him mm -hmm. weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet. Imagine kissing the feet mm. of Jesus um, and anoint them with the fragrant oil. Then when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to him to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet would know who and what manner of a woman this is, who is touching him for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Now, this is where Jesus is teaching. Mm. And this would be a good lesson for us. If, if you have that perspective 
I encourage you to change your perspective and have a biblical perspective. There is a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 dinars and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus obviously replies with, you have rightly judged, mm. right? The person that's been forgiven more will love more. Amen. Right? Those who have forgiven less, they love less. These women, as well as the men who have gone through these sexual experiments, quote unquote, high body counts, mm. you know, things like that, they have a chance to receive Jesus. And when they do, their past has been forgotten by God. Amen. We ourselves should not remember it. Yeah, it should be forgotten yeah. by us as well. Yeah. Because if we choose to remember their past, then I believe God will choose to remember our past. It's because a, he'll hold us accountable to that. It's a double standard. It's um, it's injustice, spiritually speaking. Mm. You know, we're not judging righteously. You know, the, the, the word of God tells us not to judge in an unrighteous manner. And we're looking at these women and looking at their past and saying, oh God, look how disgusting that is. Like they've been with multiple men and look at this. And you're not looking through the lens of God and you're, you're placing on them a yoke that is not on them by God. It's on them by you. Um, it reminds you of in Acts chapter 15, Paul's having this dialogue with the, the, um, the Jewish men who are coming in and they're trying to place on the new believers, the Gentiles, a yoke. They're trying to say that all the Gentiles who come to Christ, they need to fulfill the law. They need to get circumcised. They need to go to the synagogue. They need to do the rites of Moses and the rituals. And Paul says to them, hold on, hold on, hold on. You yourselves couldn't even do that. Yeah. And you're telling them they have to? He's like, no, no, no. Don't you know that we are saved by grace through faith? by what Jesus has done and that is no longer required. So a lot of these men, they've slept with so many women, but they're saying these women, well, they have to do this and this and this, that I myself couldn't do it. Yeah. I, I myself could not withhold myself or control myself from sleeping with multiple partners, but she still needs to. True. Do you know True. what I mean? Yeah. Well, the biblical, even though the biblical ethic is that both restraint until marriage and that is the ideal and i would encourage you if you can you know um through the power of the spirit if you haven't don't wait until marriage that's the ideal mm. but we live in that fallen world and it often happens it's funny right? that you're saying it because today is like how could you be a virgin mm, mm. until marriage that's not manly yeah that's not being successful in your quote-unquote it's bachelor feminine. years Right? It's feminine, they yeah. say, you know, it's a feminine ideal to, to wait till you're married. You have the freedom to enjoy that in your life. And mm -hmm. as a man, you're not held in the high esteem as, as the other women. So I think part one, as we spoke about in the previous video, is how men should view masculinity. Mm -hmm. In part two, we can see that how godly men should view the women in their lives. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the ultimate, for me, that's the ultimate test of masculinity. It's the way you're viewing the woman that God has put in your life. And if you're not married, if you're unmarried, whether it's because you haven't got the chance or whether it's because of, of divorce or whatnot, if you're not married, you still have the chance through the Spirit of God to build the blocks in your life, build that foundation that will help you to view the woman that God does put in your life. You know, you have the chance now to build your character, to say, this is what I, how I view men. This is how I view the role of being a man. This is how I view the role of a woman and the way that is going to complement each other. And we'll probably speak a little bit more about yeah. that in, in the third part. But you have to be very intentional. This is what I did this time before I was married. I, th I took maybe about two years where I was really focusing on my views on what marriage was, what it meant to be a man. I was going through the word of God, every, every part of it where it was speaking about um, being a man of God, being a man after the heart of God, how to view your women, how to treat women, um, the pitfalls that a lot of the characters in the Bible, the figures 
where they fell. Mm. I mean, we know there are so many men, King David, um, uh, Abraham, all these, all these characters in the Bible um, who were so strong in their ministries, even Samson. And where they fell was in this area of, of their life. viewing women, yeah. viewing sex, viewing the things that um, pertain to marriage. David was not a good husband. Yeah. He was a terrible husband. <laughs> Samson was not a good partner. He just, he, he, he had, I would say Samson had the very red pill ideal of um, relationships going around from woman to woman and not really viewing it the way God had desired him to. And they lost their ministries because of it. Amen. Um, well, how about we finish with this verse mm. that God is not showing any partiality yeah. between whether it's a man or a woman. If you are out there, and practicing these kind of things, mm. then God is holding you accountable. Exactly. And this is obviously 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20. Flee sexual immor immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own for you were brought at a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are god's Amen. so we want to leave that with you that um have a healthy biblical perspective on women as mm -hmm. well as on men and know how as a man as a masculine man know how to deal with these problems in your life. Mm. So God bless you all and enjoy your time. And we'll see you for part three. See you guys.